My name is Alejandro Rojas, and I am here with Martin Spectacular Willis. Oh, that's a spectacular thing to say. My guest is so important this week, and some of you may not know who he is, but I'm going to read his bio. So please, uh, sorry, Martin, this is going to take just a minute, uh, but mm. you'll understand because he's so important. His name is Dr. Eric Davis. Why is he so important? Well, there's probably two scientists in particular um, I would say who are really important right now, and that is Dr. Davis and his boss at uh, Earth Tech, Dr. Hal Putoff. That's because they both work for this Pentagon program. So we got these dirds, these reports essentially that uh, that the Pentagon asked these these scientists to write about these, you know, projects with uh, that were actually, even though they're technology based, they're, these guys. Uh, have written these things kind of based on the paranormal, and we'll get into that in this interview. But uh, let me read this this uh, bio. Eric Davis is the chief science officer of Earth Tech International and the Institute for Advanced Studies at Austin. Dr. Davis' research uh, specializations include breakthrough propulsion physics for interstellar flight, interstellar flight science, beamed energy propulsion, advanced space nuclear power and propulsion, directed energy weapons, future and transformational technology, general relativity theory, quantum field theory, quantum gravity theories, experimental quantum optics, and SETI, search for extraterrestrial intelligence, xeno archaeology. We actually had someone on to talk about xeno archaeology before. But D Dr. Davis's research activities include megawatt class laser propulsion physics systems, designing and performance metrics, and uh, mission applications for the U.S. Air Force laser light craft program, quantum optics tomography experiments to measure negative vacuum energy, studies on the multi-layered quantum vacuum structure and its applications, general relativistic time machines and causality, superluminal photons in curved space-time, gravistars and black holes, and quantum entanglement, teleportation, and non-locality, studies in traversable wormhole and warp drive space-times for faster-than-light propulsion, and feasibility studies on laser inertial confinement, inertial electrostatic confinement, Z pinch and dense plasma focus fusion concepts for space propulsion, much like the stuff that you study, uh, right, Martin? Yeah, you know, you lost me way ahead of <laughs> uh, what was it, in intervincible wormhole? <laughs> no, like I think you're way yeah. off there, but I would be yeah. too. I think you lost me back at vacuum or something. He currently yeah. serves as an adjunct professor in the Early Universe Cosmology and Strings Group at the Center for Astrophysics, Space Physics, and Engineering Research at Baylor University in Waco, Texas. He earned his PhD in astrophysics from the University of Arizona in 91, the year I graduated from high school. Uh, Dr. Davis is a fellow of the British Interplanetary Society, associate fellow of the American Institute of a Aeronautics and Astronautics, and a member of the New York Academy of Sciences, Directed Energy Professional Society, uh, the American Astronomy, Astronomical Society and the Association of Former Intelligence Officers. Wow. So a lot of stuff. And the, the reason okay. I bring all this stuff is because you can hear this is mainstream science. These are, uh, you know, credible organizations he's associated with. But what we're going to be talking about is wild and crazy stuff. So to hear, wow. you know, this this wild stuff we're talking to him about when with UFOs and paranormal and and, you know, voices coming out of nowhere related to the Skinwalker Ranch, paranormal stuff. You know, that's why I wanted to bring up the background. So in an interview I did, in fact, Martin, uh, with uh, John Alexander, Alexander had talked about how Eric Davis was a somehow a magnet for all the paranormal stuff going on at Skinwalker really? Ranch. And so we talk about that in this interview. Wow. Yeah, I, I can see with a background like that. <laughs> Holy mackerel, that is something else. Um, and I saw that he had an interest in UFOs way back. There's an old article I just read um, why he was talking about why the science community won't take you know UFOs seriously back in 2013. But he's, so he does uh, uh, light travel uh, science and research. 
Right. And I mean, space time, time warping, time travel, all of this sort of stuff. Uh, so, yeah. So when Amazing. they're talking about with To the Stars, you know, who, who works with Earth Tech and Dr. Davis in developing these technologies, and we do discuss this, you know, that they're, they're essentially getting some clues about how the technology works from just observations of UFOs. You know, this is something they're really doing that they really think they can do. And they've got these people, uh, the right people to do it. Right. Amazing. Yep. And, you know, wow. uh, we'll talk to Dr. Eric Davis about this idea because there's this idea. And I'm sure you've heard it out there. And I'd love to hear your point of view that all of this, uh, you know, to the stars and this Pentagon project, all of this coming out is part of a disclosure effort where the government or some kind of secret keepers are trying to slowly release information. But uh, Elizondo and the others we've talked to say that's not the case at all. And, you know, if you follow the history of how this has all happened, you know, Tom DeLong does not work for the government. He did this all on his own. Um, mm -hmm. He was able to then entice, you know, Elizondo to join his program. But Elizondo retired. He wasn't planning on getting this information out. Um, so he decided this on his own. Otherwise, guys like Eric Davis and Hal Putoff, who have worked on all of this stuff uh, with Bigelow and, and and the Pentagon, they've been doing this for literally decades. Um, you heard, you know, over decades they've been working on UFOs and paranormal and trying to get the mainstream to pay attention. So this isn't something new. This isn't something where some secret hand came to them and said, oh, we're going to get you to do this, this, and this. No, this is something they've been fighting for for decades. And finally, they're getting more respect and, um, you know, more attention than ever. And we'll get into that when we get into the news. But uh, we'll talk to Dr. Davis about his thoughts regarding all that as well. Wow. Sounds like a fantastic guest. I am very happy to welcome to the show for the first time, Dr. Eric Davis. Hello. How are you? Fine. I'm doing great. How are you doing? I am doing very well. And I guess my first question, because we have a lot to get into, is what do you think of this news uh, coming just recently that the Navy is working up some guidelines on uh, UFO reporting? Well, it's about time. And uh, <clears throat> the Navy has always led all of the service branches in, in many areas. And this is just another example where they're ahead of the curve, whereas the Army and the Air Force just shy away. Uh, for example, the Navy is the leader in directed energy weapons development in the uh, Department of Defense. So uh, they have uh, had the uh, most accelerated schedule for developing directed energy uh, and deploying it on uh, combat test vehicles. Well, first doing experimental prototyping and testing and then deploying it on a combat vehicle out in the Persian Gulf. So they're way ahead of where the Army, the Marine Corps, and, and the Air Force have been. And <clears throat> those services haven't even yet fielded any, any prototypical combat uh, weapons that uh, can be fielded, that have been fielded. They haven't done that. They're just doing uh, development and testing, and they'll be doing prototyping inside the United States, and they're just lagging behind. And then with the UFO subject comes along here, well, what do you know? It's the Navy that's having all the problems with the encounters of Tic Tac, like UFOs or other UFOs, and, um, and so they're the ones that are going to take the lead to mandate a specific recording, uh, uh, reporting protocol for everybody that has such encounters. Mm -hmm. And did you think as far as the leadership is concerned, are they concerned about a, a possible unknown or do you think that they mostly feel that these could be foreign adversaries just using technology we don't recognize? Well, the first hypothesis is it's a foreign adversary that we don't recognize. But then once you do the analysis of the, uh, <clears throat> the F-18 fighter FLIR videos and radar from the surface warships that like for example I'm speaking of the uh, USS Nimitz uh, carrier strike groups encounter with the Tic Tac back in November 2004 in the first week I believe for a whole for about a week of, of encounters and <clears throat> when you look at visual sightings uh, timings uh, scoped sightings that were done from on board the ships using sophisticated observational scopes that they use out in the ocean. And then, of course, the weapon systems, radar and 
uh, aviation radar, and then the fighters have their own systems and so forth. Uh, when you look at when you look at when first contact is made, and then how rapidly the object moves and changes altitude and uh, hovers over the ocean and zips off again, uh, and is changing altitudes by dozens of, of tens of thousands of feet or dozens of times tens of thousands of feet. Um, in a matter of three to five seconds, you're you're not basically talking about human technology. There's no Russian or Chinese or North Korean or Iranian or anybody else, no, no NATO or any other alliance or non-alliance country, non-allied countries, have any sort of technology that can perform the way these Tic Tacs uh, were found to be performing. <clears throat> and it's really easy to discern the difference between <clears throat> even an unknown man-made object and and uh, and uh, this phenomenon, because unknown man-made objects have to obey the laws of uh, of aerodynamics <clears throat> and the engineering that's associated with that. And <clears throat> excuse me, when the Tic Tacs don't have any observable control surfaces, they don't have any appendages, they don't have any external engines and and um, engine mounts and pylons. Uh, uh, what am I thinking of? I can't think of the word that right now, but. <clears throat> It's how the engines are connected up. And uh, um, so control surfaces are lacking. Uh, external propulsion is lacking. Uh, you don't see windows. And so, you know, what, what is this? This isn't anything a drone, even a drone wouldn't look like this. <clears throat> all drones have, <clears throat> all drones have an engine, a propulsion system, which is very <clears throat> easy and obvious to observe. <clears throat> And their uh, and their structural fuselages are, are also very easy to discern and and determine <clears throat> when they adhere to the human designs for aeronautical platforms that move through air. <clears throat> the things we're seeing uh, are not shaped <laughs> in the usual typical way that we humans would shape them. So you you, <clears throat> you got you got to come up with another hypothesis, and the only hypothesis is something unknown mm -hmm. and. <clears throat> And it's got a good chance that it's not human technology. So thank you for that. But uh, we'll get into your background now and kind of, you know, related to this. Now, you've been doing this and, and a lot of your colleagues uh, that you work with in particular, how put off, of course, you've been working in this arena for decades. But there are these ideas out there right now that this is part of some controlled disclosure that, you know, this has all been planned. And if that was so, that would mean that you were part of some bigger plan. I mean, is, is that something that you feel is credible at all? Do you see that? Or is this just kind of the fruits of your efforts, all of your efforts to bring kind of the credibility to um, these more, what would be considered fringe areas of science? Well, it's two things. It's, it's the cumulative effect of all of our efforts, decades of efforts of hard work. But uh, the release of this information is driven strictly by the phenomenon itself. Uh, all this nonsense about a, a planned di disclosure or confirmation, that's all conspiracy theory nonsense. And it's <clears throat> one of the first order hypotheses that jumps into many people's not minds when they're uninformed about what's going on. The gov United States government is such a big and complex organization, uh, multiple organizations, I should say, interconnecting, interlocking, and, and you know, uh, by, by deliberative reasons, Parts of it are secret, and other parts are not secret. And so uh, parts that are secret don't talk to the non-secret parts, and even the parts that are secret don't talk among themselves or within themselves because of compartmentalization or, certain, or the differences in classification, many different secrets out. So, uh, so <laughs> there is no coordinated anything, because I have to guarantee you that the United States government is not that coordinated, especially in the Donald Trump era. <laughs> right. So, anyway, anyway, the, mm -hmm. the, this is there's no such thing as a coordinated or uncoordinated or planned or unplanned disclosure. Uh, that's all been a salesman pitch that was invented by a lot of the more vocal, high-profile celebrities in ufology, and that's how they sell their books. That's how they sell. Uh, tickets to uh, their special events, and that's how UFO conferences uh, sell tickets to their conferences when these type of people are 
invited as guest speakers. Uh, this lies in the in the realm of rational, scientific, and bureaucratic thinking. <laughs> the UFO phenomenon has been encountering naval weapons platforms repeatedly and has created a dangerous environment for the pilots, for the human pilots that are involved. And so now it's becoming a great safety issue because the numbers or the frequency, well, I should say the numbers and the frequency of the encounters is pretty big. And it is not minute. It's not rare. It's not once in a while. It's more like, yeah, it's, it's pretty often. And it isn't located in one's geography. It's spread across the globe. And it's interacting with the U.S. Navy. So that's been driving their desire to want to do this new reporting protocol and put it out there, which Politico just reported yesterday. So, uh, and then as far as uh, what Lou Elizondo did after he retired from the DOD is he was pretty upset that uh, this program, the AAWSAP program, and it's not really called the ATIP, AATIP, that's... Uh, that's the uh, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program that Harry Reid pulled out from thin air and made it up on his own in a letter that he wrote to Deputy Secretary of Defense William Wynn many years ago. And the actual program is AAWSAP, and I forget, Advanced Aerospace Weapons something System or another. I don't remember. Application what Program. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's probably it. So, uh, and it turned out, anyway, I think this is a kind of goes back to your communication issue because it turned out, I think what it, it, it seems what had happened is Harry Reid was aware that Lou and his, uh, the guy running AAWSAP had been working on ATIP and using the term, but that information probably didn't get to you all because you were hired by and working with AAWSAP. Uh, no, it's just that Harry Reid wasn't fully briefed on everything. Well, that's, I mean, how Lou, that's how Lou had said, that, that actually Harry okay, Reid... Okay, well... Yeah. Okay, well, I'm not going to contradict Lou then, that's fine. I My view is, yeah, we we were working as subcontractors to Bigelow Aerospace Advanced Space Studies, who had the contract to the Defense Intelligence Agency, and so... Uh, yeah, our worldview was AAWSAP, and then all of a sudden we see AATIP pop up. Okay, so <laughs> I'm not going to contradict Lou. He knows more about it at that level. I didn't sit in his office and hear all this right. uh, jargon go flashing by. I'm, down, I'm one of the worker bees who are ex expediting the mission. And um, <clears throat> anyway, so no, there's no, there's no, there's no conspiracy the theory. There's no, uh, uh, there's no long, you know, it's like the long-awaited re uh, return of Jesus. Well, okay. everybody's had the long-awaited disclosure, and it's like, no, this isn't it. Uh, well, and we're, I... We're, I... We're, we're, however, however, uh -huh. officially, uh, the United States government, uh, uh, via the DOD, of course, I, I'll, I'll reverse it, the DOD has issued an official confirmation. So that's what they've done. They, they've officially confirmed it. Now, mm -hmm. they have done disclosure. What they've disclosed is, hey, they have had encounters with unusual craft that they cannot identify as human-made uh, or unknown human-made craft. In, in, in other words, they don't. The objects don't follow the aerodynamic rules of engineering. Okay, they just mm -hmm. don't. Okay, and that's driven by physics. Right. And they, I'm not saying that they're breaking laws of physics. So don't quote me on on, right. on anything having to do with well, they're they're operating on a new physics we haven't invented, or or no, they're breaking the laws of physics. It is possible they're operating on a physics we haven't invented or haven't discovered yet. That's possible. We don't know. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, uh, the point is is that uh, that these things are operating. They go way outside the envelope of our engineering and physics technologies and. And uh, uh, I can guarantee you that no laws of physics are broken whatsoever. It's just that it's either uh, the existing laws that we have, but we haven't uh, extrapolated it further enough, further enough, or expanded it enough into realms or uh, say areas of phase space where we could discover new solutions to uh, these existing physical laws which would give us advanced propulsion and power that would produce this type of technology once you have an engineering and a manufacturing technology to create these things. So that's where we're at. 
And these things don't look like anything that we can manufacture on Earth, so we don't have the manufacturing or industrial technology for it. We don't have an engineering for it. In other words, the blueprints and designs to get something shaped like shaped like a, an air, uh, a fighter-sized piece of candy mouth bent, <laughs> uh. and uh, get that to fly through the air stably, and uh, <clears throat> and do the wonderful things that they do in the air, as reported by the F-18 pilots at the uh, associated with the Nimitz Carrier Strike Group. Right. So, and then uh, of course, and then we have the history of UFO, of UFO encounters mm-hmm. that we've seen all. You know, we we know about it. You know, uh, Jacques Vallée has recorded all this in his books. Uh, uh, Alan Hynek and Jacques Vallée and uh, uh, Bob Emenegger in his book associated with his uh, TV documentary, UFOs, It Has Begun, or UFOs Past, Present, and Future, which, you know, two different versions because one was an updated version of the other. And, uh, and so all the other uh, well-known UFO researchers in academia and industry and government who had done all the investigations and identified as many witness descriptions of UFOs. When you look at these things, which were really well exemplified in the schematic artwork shown in Bob Emenegger's book from 1974, um, it's clear that these things have different shapes that are not aerodynamic. They just don't follow the human engineering physics principles for Mm -hmm. uh, aviation um, or aeronautical or aerospace flight. Mm -hmm. And, I do so want to get that's, into that's a few other things, yeah, and I think that you've shown that well, and I do appreciate you answering the question about the, you know, um, um, disclosure conspiracy, and I, I am even a little embarrassed to ask, because I do not see that present when looking into and researching any of this. I see a history, a rich history of you all working on this for years, but, you know, it's something that comes up and, and readers wanted to know, but I want to get into your background and that history. So when was it that you began working on, I'm not sure what you refer to it, but kind of what is considered kind of fringe science? Uh, I don't call it fringe science. Uh-huh. Uh, I call it I call it out-of-the-box science. Mm-hmm. <laughs> fringe has a negative connotation. Um, it's not exactly an accurate word to use. Uh, we just call it out-of-the-box, cutting edge, pioneering. I love that. Um, breakthrough, breakthrough science, etc. Um, I became the, the world's, I became among the world's first few full-time paid professional scientists who were investigating UFOs. When I got hired uh, by Bob Bigelow to work at the National Institute for Discovery Science in July of 1996. And then I went to work for him in Las Vegas. And then I was joined by Colin Kelleher and Dr. Uh, who's got a PhD in biochemistry, molecular biology, immunology, and he's, he's got quite a background in, in immunology and, and uh, diseases, mostly virology and cancers. So, and then we were joined by Dr. George Onette, who is a world-famous, uh, world-renowned uh, Romanian veterinary pathologist who specialized in avian and bovine diseases. And uh, we joined together with Colonel John Alexander, who has a PhD in thanatology and uh, he studies death, and uh, he was interested in, you know, uh, survival consciousness after death. And he was working for Bob Bigelow at the time on the NIT staff. And um, and so we all came together. And, of course, John had been working for Bob for some time before we got hired. The three of us got hired in July of 1996. And uh, all of our work, or a good chunk of our work, was uh, well recorded and documented in Kelleher and Knapp's book, Hunt for the Skinwalker, um, which you're familiar with. Yes, And very. Um, so especially our work out on the uh, NIDS UFO ranch uh, up in northeast Utah in the Utah Valley. And uh, so that documents a good chunk of what we did at NIDS, not everything, because that, was about, that book was about the ranch. And we did a lot more than just the ranch. Right. Uh, we often use the ranch and Las Vegas as our headquarters, to uh, go investigate cattle mutilations and UFO and crypto terrestrial sightings. And uh, uh, so just whatever, whatever was convenient. The ranch is really nice because it's, it's closer to the upper, upper western side of the Midwest. And Las Vegas is in the, really you know, closer to California, so we're in the Pacific Coast area in Las Vegas. So we can reach quite a bit of places from there, but we're still kind of far removed from the from the actual Midwest and the East Coast areas. So it's just that uh, Bigelow 
didn't want to expand NIBS any further than Las Vegas. And so we just had those two jumping off bases from which we could do investigations. So we ma- mainly stayed regional within that area. And uh, we had our 1-800 number line that was set up and the FAA collaboration that was set up so that if anybody called in UFO reports, they could call our 1-800 number and we could do a preliminary interview with the caller, take information to make a decision on whether uh, uh, it was necessary to send investigators out to investigate their sighting and uh, whatnot. Mm-hmm. So anyway, we, I did that for six years until my job got eliminated during a downsizing of NIDS because of the emergence of Bigelow Aerospace. Bob, was, Bob Bigelow was shifting his attention away from UFOs because he kind of had uh, uh, about a five-year uh, attention span on, on these types of things, and he figured we'd have all the problems solved by then, and that's not possible. Um uh, there's a lot of scientific problems, especially in phenomenology, which can take uh, more than a decade of research and study and investigations, collecting data and analyzing it and forming and reforming or, or f- changing hypotheses until you finally converge on the hypothesis or the theory that uh, is, is doing very well to explain all the data uh-huh. you're collecting. Cool. And, and, and so... And so I was going to so, say. Well, I, I was just going to wrap mm-hmm. it up. So I was there, for, and then I went to work for the Air Force Research Lab as a contractor to the Advanced Concepts Program Office at Edwards Air Force Base, California, and I did that uh, from uh, eight, from uh, actually I started working for them before my job got eliminated. So from January until uh, mid 2005, I was working for them. But I started working for Hal Putoff as a research physicist. In November of 2004, and I've been working for HAL ever since then, and uh, I got promoted up uh, a few years ago up to chief science officer. So, uh, well, I became senior research physicist among the uh, uh, other staff of the other physicists we had who had been here uh, about uh, six years earlier than I have, six years longer than I have. HAL was also on the staff as uh, as the pres- as the director of the Institute for Advanced Studies at Austin. So he was the director. He's also a research physicist in his own right, of course, which you probably know. And um, so there were three of us physicists on the staff, and then we had uh, a couple of lab engineers who would put our experiments together, and then other support personnel. And uh, and so I just rose up through the ranks and became the chief science officer, which is where I'm at now. Mm-hmm. Now, in that history, uh, when you talked about Skinwalker, for instance, I've talked with Colm and with Alexander, and I guess the first question we would be, they both kind of had this this view that they were outsmarted by the phenomena. In fact, you know, Alexander uses this term, um, kind of a, a precognitive sentient phenomena. Would you agree with that kind of that uh, estimation or, or thought? Yeah, that's pretty much true. Mm-hmm. That's pretty much true. Yeah, I was always one step ahead of us. And John talked about one person in particular that the phenomena seemed to center around. And from what I gather, that might have been you. Is that true? Yeah, pr- pretty much. But Colin Kelleher had witnessed some events. So he, I wasn't the only one that had the, all of the experiences. I had uh, many experiences, and some of those I had with Colin. And wow. um, but then uh, there were experiences that Colm and I did not have because we got to a point where we needed to rotate staff on and off the ranch because Colm and I were fathers of very small children, very young children in school back in those days. And so, you know, we need to stay home a lot more. Otherwise, our wives would get angry if we're gone too long. So uh, George Annette was uh, relatively single. I mean, he was still married. His kids were grown, and his wife was working as a professional scientist in another state where they originally lived before he came to Las Vegas. So uh, he didn't have any family duties in Vegas. So we had him, and then we had Canadian um, field investigator Chad Deetkin, and uh, and we didn't have Shelley Wadsworth involved with us directly. She was indirectly involved because she worked for Bob Bigelow as one of his field investigators, and so she would be more like a conduit of information. And uh, but she would do background stuff for us or bring it to information in our direction and we'd act on it. So we had Shelly Wadsworth, Chad Deacon, but of the people that went to the ranch, it was basically Colin, George, myself, Chad, uh, and the former ranch owner, 
And um, after he left and moved moved away with his family to another state, we got the retired chief deputy of the Uinta County Sheriff's Department to take over the former ranch manager's job, and he became the new ranch manager. And his work for us also included him doing some investigations in the area for us. So he became an investigator as well. And then later on down the road, Nitz hired a couple more investigators. We had John Valier, who was a retired FBI special agent, and then uh, Roger Pinson, who was retired uh, from the San Diego Police Department, who had worked for the Nevada State Law Enforcement. I can't remember which it was. It was uh, having to do with the transportation policing on the highways. Uh, I'm not sure if it was – I don't know that he was a highway patrol officer, but – he was in that capacity, and then he left that job and came to work for us as a uh, full-time investigator. Roger, before becoming a police officer, was actually at the AFOSI. He was a special agent with AFOSI. So um, so he's an expert investigator like John Valier. So right. we had quite a bit of staff, and we were investigating a lot of UFO cases. Not everything was on the ranch. Mm-hmm. Um, so we had periods of quiescence on the ranch. So there were always up cycles, down cycles, where there was the, where the activity would get hot or it would just go, get cold. And then it reached a point uh, by about 2000, it started getting cold. Right. And stayed cold through 2001, and by early 2002, that's when Bob decided to start. Uh, actually, starting in 2000, Bob started cutting personnel because that's when the ranch ph- uh, phenomenon started getting too cold that it didn't justify having all those all that staff. Also, we didn't have that many outside UFO invest, uh, cases called into our one eight hundred number, so we didn't have a lot coming in, and the FAA wasn't reporting a lot to us either. So it just got very slow, and Bob is very frugal about his money, so he, you know, he wants to cut back. He's building that aerospace company up, and he needs right. the money to do that with. So we had to cut our budget to come up with more money every time. So by two thousand one, my uh, two thousand two, John Alexander and Pete Pickup and I. Um, and I think Chad Deacon and Shelly Wadsworth, we all had lost our positions. So, mm-hmm. um, and, and Shelly and Chad weren't full time. So I got to be clear, they were only paid when they had an assignment. And so they were they were like ten ninety nine employees. Mm-hmm. Um, but Colin, George, and John Alexander and I were all full time employees of NIDS. And uh, John Alexander also lost his job the same time I did mm-hmm. in the sp- in the late winter of of uh, in, I should say in early 2002, which was still the winter, and then my job mm-hmm. actually terminated in the spring because I had some uh, uh, unused vacation and sick leave I could use up before I actually uh, was off the payroll. So, um, when it comes to the UFO reporting, um, in 2009, you know, Bass uh, Big Loads. Uh, Advanced Aerospace Group had a partnership with MUFON, and I was actually the PR guy, so I was coming up with like the the press releases for all of this okay. stuff. And uh, but now in hindsight, you know, I kind of scratch my head and I think, wow, I was part of that program, but did that re- program receive some of those ATIP fundings? Do you know? Did it? Uh, I didn't get that question. Can you repeat it, please? Did the MUFON Bass Relation Partnership was that funding from? Uh, OSAP or ATIP? Uh, I believe so. It would make that sense. Wasn't anything, that, that was nothing I had any role in. So my mm. recollection is that I believe that, that the MUFON funding was, did come out of that. Uh-huh. So another question is uh, related, and I want to ask more about some of this. But uh, So Kit Green and Gary Nolan are both kind of working on these projects to kind of identify people who experience paranormal phenomena or even with have remote viewing skills. Can we identify in their DNA or, or parts of their brains that, that make them more uh, capable of these things or more susceptible to experiences? Have they come to yeah. you and taken samples from you? Uh there's a part of that question that last. Can you repeat that last part of that question? So have they? Uh, it, you skipped out. Have you been part of that uh, experiment? Oh uh, no, I was a test subject. In other words, I contributed blood. <laughs> uh-huh. But no, I'm not a part of that because I'm not a medical guy. That's that's. Uh, well, and that's, that's that was that we, the sense I meant it, were you kind of a test subject, because you had these experiencers at Skinwalker, and I guess, were you ever frightened? Did you feel threatened? Me? Um, not really. 
What was the no, most not really. harrowing experience, I guess, that you had? I know, was that experience... Well, I, uh-huh, go ahead. I never really had a harrowing experience. I think the Dark Shadow experience was pretty... Star- I would say startling experiences. That you know, portal? Experiences that, yeah, uh, the Dark Shadow and the Ball of Light that came before the orb that came before it, and then the shooting incident that we had at a separate time. Oh, I'm not uh, aware of that one, I don't think. I don't remember it. Oh, that was in the book. Yeah, that's the one in the book where, um, Jesus, that's that's over 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, we were out in the field at night. <clears throat> I think we were having to do something to deal with a pregnant cow that was giving birth, um, and the herd was getting uh, restless, so uh, the ranch manager thought, well, you know, there might be a big cat lurking around, and they usually like to lurk when the cows are most vulnerable because they're giving birth. So he was kind of concerned. We had to go look outside to find out. We had to get in his pickup and go drive around to find out if there was any big cats out there and then take a look at what the cows are doing and find out about that pregnant cow. And I believe that was the case about the pregnant cow. I may be wrong about that, but that's what I thought. That's what I'm thinking in my mind is I thought we were worried about a pregnant cow. Mm-hmm. But in other words, I do know that we were worried about the cows overall being stirred up by something. Uh, and so uh, we're in the near we're in the near pasture closest to the ranch to the uh, to the uh, manufactured home that Bigelow had installed for the staff to live in. We call that the observation house. And right next door to that is the house where the previous owners lived. And and um, uh, so anyway. So uh, we were out that night. I don't remember now what time in the night it was. It was kind of late. It was definitely dark. I don't remember what time of the year. It was warm. Uh, it could have been spring or fall. Uh, you know, I'm not that good about bovine issues. I think it might have been the spring because if one is being born, it will probably be born in the spring or late winter, but it was a warm season. So uh, I'm. we're driving around in the near field, near pasture, and – uh, there's a certain tree on a corner where the fence, where the barbed wire fence makes a 90 degree turn from going west to going uh, north, I believe. And well, I may have my directions turned around. So, but nevertheless, it's a corner tree. It's a big Russian olive tree. And I think this is the, you know, it may have been the beginning of spring because I, I remember there were no leaves in the tree yet. So it might have been the end of winter, beginning of spring, but it was still, you know, not cold. So uh, I noticed two really large glowing yellow eyes. They looked like the eyes of a big cat, a predator cat. The only problem is they were too big, they were too far apart, and they were up near the top of the tree. Well, you know, in the, in the, in the main bulk of the branches, but close to the top, uh, somewhere in the top one-third of it. And they're just blinking. And I'm thinking, what the hell is that? I've never seen a cat that big or with eyes that wide and big, and I'm thinking, no, that's no cat. So, um, so uh, I called, you know, Colin Kelleher was with me, and so was the ranch manager. So I called their attention to it, and they saw it. And then uh, the ranch manager thought, oh, my God, that's a cat. You know, he immediately jumped to conclusions it was a cat. He had his rifle and his spotlight with him. So um, we drove toward it, and what I remember is that the light, the eyes – disappeared and it looked like something fell from the tree and hit the ground and then i didn't see anything after that it's just it's just like the eyes closed up up in the tree and it might have and and i thought something was falling and hit the ground and i didn't see anything run away but there was nothing there so we parked the pickup in front of the left to the left of that in front of the fence and that and behind the fence is all this thick foliage. I mean, Russian olives and all kinds of other trees and shrubs and bushes out there, overgrown grass and whatnot. And now that I think about it, yes, it was near the end of winter. Um, it was it was winter time, as a matter of fact. Now that I think about it, it wasn't really that warm. And I remember because we had snow on the ground. In peace, not it wasn't uh, snow covered. It was just patches of snow that was left over from an earlier snow, and the ground had warmed up enough that a lot of it melted off and only cool part, only parts of it that were in the shade all the time were the only patches that stayed intact, but slowly melting away as the temperatures were warming up. So I think we were in this winter spring transition. So, uh, so anyway, uh, we parked the truck, Terry got out with his rifle and handed me the spotlight. I got out and, uh, he told me to aim the spotlight. We're looking along the fence line in the trees to look for this animal because he's worried it's a big cat and he's got to shoot it. 
problem. We didn't see the thing with the glowing big eyes, but we saw something whose body profile we saw right in front of us on the other side of the wire. You couldn't see the rear end. You couldn't see the front. You just saw the middle of this body that looked fairly big. To me, it looked like a, a big cow. Um, but to Terry, it looked like a bear. <clears throat> and we were at point blank range from it. So he just shot some, he just fired some shots at it. It didn't flinch. And it just walked off into the shrubs and disappeared. We couldn't see the hind end of this thing. Wow. So we, uh, yeah, so all three of us got our way through the barbed wire. We had to split the barbed wire apart to get through. We got in, and there's a clearing behind all the shrubs and trees. And we followed the clearing thinking, well, that's the only place it's going to go. And there's no footprints in the, in the, in the ground, on the ground at all, nothing. There's no blood. There's no broken twigs or anything. Then we finally run into the little patches of snow. And in the patches of snow, there's no footprints and no blood drops or trails of lots of blood that you would expect from an animal that's been shot several times and nothing except one single deer footprint, just one single deer footprint, not two, not three, not four, just one. And it was pointed back in the direction of the pickup, not in the direction that we would expect if it was running away from us. So that was odd, and we didn't see any other footprints. And, I mean, this ground is, is a bit muddy from the uh, snow melt. And, and, so the, and, this is, and this print was on the patch of snow. So, anyway, we gave up because we looked all around. We couldn't find anything. So uh, we reported it to Bob Bigelow later on. And uh, the, next, the next morning, Bob got his uh, master hunter tracker, who's the ranch manager for his – private ranch and i won't say what state that is uh he i think he manages bob's personal vacation ranch in another state and uh, bob flew him in on his jet to our ranch uh and actually went to the airport at vernal utah and you have to drive 23 miles to get to to get to fort Duchesne. so that guy showed up and he's an expert uh hunter tracker so he started working in a five mile radius starting from the shooting spot and just tracked that thing everywhere. He just could not find a single sign of a large animal that had been shot multiple times and no carcass, no nothing, no blood, wow. um, no footprint, no hoof prints or, or yeah, no hoof prints is what you would expect. So that was the, that was the one experience. And then I had a couple of crazy experiences, uh, actually one in the same, uh, just two separate buildings. It's the second home. It's the homestead the crumbled down 19th century homestead where I had the dark shadow incident and the orb incident with Colin Kelleher. And uh, I went into those homes doing some field readings with the radiation Geiger counter and uh, the, and the tri-field meter looking at the field situation, uh, electric magnetic and uh, radio and uh, whatnot. And then the, and then looking at the nuclear radiation and, of course, it's nothing out there. It's quiet. And I stepped into one of the homesteads, and I got attacked. And what looked like bats to me is are swirling around like they were angry. And I just ran out of there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I would say, yeah, I got frightened. But that, that was – so I, I kind of have to backtrack on my earlier statement that I had uh, – you know, I was – you know, the experience I previously described, well, I didn't consider to be frightening – uh, but this frightened me because it got my heart rate going, and uh, I had to run out of there because I didn't know what to do because I got what I thought were bats swirling around. Well, that happened a second time, uh, and I don't remember now whether it was the same incident or whether I went in a separate time, a separate day, and had the same thing within the second house. There's two little old houses next door to mm. each other. And so I went into the second one had the same experience, and these are taking place in the living room areas. And what I, upon reporting it to Colin, we go back in another, the next day, take a look when we've got full sunshine. And I think this happened uh, late afternoon, early evening, so I don't have full sunshine going on. And uh, I think actually they were. They were just after dusk. Actually, now that I remember, the, the events were just after dusk. So we found a sparrow nest up on the corners of the wall and the ceiling. Uh, more than one. There were several sparrow nests, and sparrows use mud. They uh, they uh, take in mud in their beaks, and I don't know if they actually swallow it. They probably swallow it, and then they regurgitate it to make these uh, little mud huts up in the wall in the corner area to protect their eggs. 
and uh, that's what they were. They weren't bats. They were sparrows, and they scared the mm. crap out of me. <laughs> so and nothing paranormal the there. Yeah, but, uh, you know, we attribute that. Actually, uh, if you want to look at it on a scientific basis, holistically, you don't want to say I just walked in and, and scared the shit out of a, a, a few sparrows, mother sparrows that were protecting their eggs. What it could have been is that, yeah, they were there, but, um, and I think the common denominator would be, yeah, that's what I did. I scared them, so they decided to go on the attack by flying around me. Uh, the problem is, is that uh, it may have actually been a part of the phenomenon that I would have stepped into there and gotten attacked. Now, I wasn't disturbing. This is the funny thing. I wasn't disturbing anything. I did not poke those things. I did see them. I didn't poke them. I wasn't making noise. I was actually walking around quietly and just using the meters, taking a look at stuff. And all of a sudden, these black things, these winged black things that I thought were bats were just rushing my head in circles. And um, uh, I just don't know. I just, uh, John Alexander has a, has a good background. Colin Kelleher does in that that I do on explaining that part of the, that part of the event. But that would, and, and Colin has written about it in the sense that he can come up with a, uh, an explanation that it was the phenomenon. It was the act of the phenomenon that that had happened to me and me only, whereas other people have been in those two houses and never had that problem like I did. Hmm. And it seemed that that problem only had followed me twice. So do you I feel that I had another? Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask you, do you feel that you were a magnet for the phenomena? And if so, do you know why? Do you have any ideas? Well, that's a hypothesis we have on people like abductees or people who are not abductees but have uh, more than the usual statistical probability of uh, close encounter experiences of the worst or the of the mediocre of the or of the worst kind. Uh, people, you're you you can actually psychically act as an antenna for the phenomenon, and it turns out that uh, the studies that uh, Kit Green and Gary Nolan have done, along with Colin's help is that they have discovered that the bio... Well, uh, uh, it, it, they're not physicists. I would put it in the terms of biophysics. I'll just say the biology or the bioimmunology or the bioscience of the immune system is that your immune system, which I don't know how many of American people know this or are aware of it, depending upon their degree of education, uh, is that your immune system is a separate organ in your body. It's not just a system of chemicals. Your immune system is an organ, and it regenerates itself, like some of your other organs. And also, it's super sensitive. And genetically, Gary Nolan and Colin Kelleher discovered that the immune system records every single event that has ever happened in your life. So it's like the Library of Congress that, every, that records everything that occurred since the day you were born, probably even before you were born. Um, and one of the things it records are the insults that your body has taken due to environmental exposure hmm. or injuries or diseases, and it keeps a perfect record of that stuff. And so they hypothesize that, you know, this is, this is really greater. It's, it's acting like a brain, <clears throat> and it's responding like a brain in a, in a psychic way. So um, although it's tied into your, you know, your real brain, but it, it does behave as if it has its own mind. So anyway, their hypothesis is, and I don't remember all the discussions that we've had on this because that was many, many years ago, but the gist of what I know is that the immune system works like an antenna. It absorbs everything in the environment around you. And that might be the reason why the phenomenon is interested in you because there might, it, uh, it may know that you've got some genetic predisposition that it's interested in the most. And that's what Gary and Kit's work is all about, is why are certain people highly sensitive to being this, having this genetic uh, disposition to phenomenon encounters? Mm -hmm. And then they go into the caudate patamen uh, studies using fMRI scans and, um, and whatnot. And so, you know, the rest of that story. So it seems that uh, there are people that are more sensitive than others, and it is, just isn't in this great old-fashioned brain psychic sense you might need to throw the immune system into it because the immune system does behave like an antenna that sucks in information, records it, and it's got knowledge. And it may be communicating in its own way that we, you know, we haven't fully discovered everything that it does to my understanding. 
And so it's still under study. And genetics is very complicated. Genetics is not straightforward and it's not linear. It's a very nonlinear, uh, non, non-straightforward, non uh, very counterintuitive thing that produces life in this, you know, at least on this planet. And uh, as far as we know, well, there's still much more to be learned. We haven't learned all there is to know about or to find out about it. We're still making those discoveries. Mm-hmm. So the same goes for the immune system because the immune system is a function of genetics, of course. So. So when you refer to abduction, do you believe that people actually are being taken, physically taken by extraterrestrials? I don't think they're being taken by extraterrestrials. Uh, We don't have proof that they're extraterrestrials. We know that Mm -hmm. whatever it is is not human. Now, there is a hypothesis that they've been abducted by a covert, clandestine, rogue, non-state operation that uh, looks at people of specific backgrounds with specific predispositions. Maybe it's a genetic thing, too. And they get abducted because they're being tested or examined or, or there's a purpose involved with that. Um, that's a hypothesis I've, been, I've heard among my colleagues. Mm-hmm. Um, and the standard hypothesis that comes from John Mack and David Jacobs and, and uh, Bud Hopkins' work has all been... Uh, uh, the extraterrestrial hypothesis that UFOs are from another planet, they're coming down, they're going to pick a few humans off, to, off the ground to, to evaluate them, just like you, just like a cattle rancher who's breeding a specific breed of Black Angus or a specific breed of Charlotte's cattle, wants to walk randomly into the pen or into the pasture, nab a particular cow, take it back and like the former ranch manager, the original owner of the, of the ranch at the time that we, in, in our era, uh, the one who reported all of his uh, family's problems with that phenomenon and, and uh, ended up working for Bob Bigelow when they left the ranch. Um, what he was, was he was a college educated, um, uh, very sophisticated animal husbandry expert. And it uh, wasn't just his uh, skill at running a ranch, raising cattle, it was his skill in that he was able to do crossbreeding and hybridization breeding using the techniques he learned in college. And that was, he could transplant embryos. He could, he knew all the process and procedures for developing bovine embryos and transplanting them in order to get the best breed of cattle with the best meat quality for a market. So, uh, he was that sophisticated. So he's going to wander into the ranch and just grab a, a, you know, this, this female there, that female there, and take him into the to the lab or whatever he had at, at the ranch that he, uh, that served as a spot for examining his cattle, his two mm-hmm. cows, his breeding cows. Uh, so you know that's that's similar in a way. It's almost a similar function. The only thing I caution your listeners is don't assume that you can apply human ways of thinking about these things because although there's a metaphorical analogy to it. Um, the fact is, is that anything that's non-human necessarily will not think like a human because of the way they evolved, mm-hmm. the way their senses developed, and uh, the way their senses provide information into whatever neurological, complex neurological cognitive system organ in their in their bodies, which we would call a brain. So, um, so they're not going to have the same ways or methods and frame of mind and processes to think and rationalize the way humans do because of the environment they came from. So we can't assume that. Now, if you're thinking they're a rogue covert operation of some sort, whether military or non-state actors, uh, sure, they're going to behave like humans do. They're going to operate like humans do. But uh, if, if you're going to take the hypothesis that this isn't human, then don't overlay human thinking and human framework or human frame of mind, I should say, and human theories and human explanations and speculations on what they're doing because what they're doing you do not know they haven't communicated that to us Mm -hmm. we have no idea what that's about we can speculate endlessly so right and that's a hard part be very cautious about that it's a hard part with speculation especially with science we don't know what we don't know and typically the answers are things we can't even speculate because we don't know yeah, we know. Oh, we do know one thing: they're there. They're doing something. We don't know their origin because they don't want to communicate that to us. Right. Um, 
What about so, the crashes? Are, are like there's there's been some references. I'm pretty skeptical when it comes to alleged UFO crashes, but I think you've made some comments. Uh, maybe some others that have worked with ATIP have made comments that there may be a program to look into that, or there there may have been crashes. You all feel? Uh, I, yeah, there have been crashes. Uh, the superpowers on the Earth have had their share of crashes, and they have recovered the vehicles from their crashes. So uh, that's why Shockton Lee and I agree that even though these things behave like a conscious, spiritual, psychic entity, they, they do have a advanced technology. They have hardware, and uh, there, there's a craft, and there's occupants, or euphonauts, that he calls them, that Shockton Lee calls them euphonauts. <laughs> so there's uh, euphonauts running these craft, whatever they may be. And he likes to make an analogy of these of these beings to the little people or the fairies of Europe and Ireland and um, uh, uh, Magonia. Remember that the passport to Magonia, one of his books, mm-hmm. and uh, that kind of thing. So that's fair enough. Um, so anyway, um, so yeah, they have that technology. We do too, and it's a very super sensitive topic. Because it's, it's something that uh, your listeners are probably going to be shocked at. Probably less than one one thousandth or one one hundred thousandth of the United States military and the government overall doesn't even know about it. Uh, or, or, I'm sorry, I, got, I, I said that contradictory. I said probably a, a minute fraction, a, like less than one one thousandth or one one hundred thousandth of the people with the uh, need to know access, need to know authorization, and security clearances to be involved with that type of work are the only ones that know the vast majority of the rest of the government really doesn't know. And that's why one hand, like the right hand, doesn't know what the left hand is doing, Mm. virtually because of the stovepiping that goes on in compartmentalized programs. And uh, you just can't knock on doors and say, hey, here's who I am. I've got, you know, I don't have... I've got clearances, but not the right ones. I don't have the need to know, but I want to know. So can you tell me? And you're going to be lied to, because that's, that's the will. You, you don't want to tell the enemy anything. This guy who's knocking on your door asking you about UFO crashes could be an asset for the Soviet Union or the Russian Federation or the Chinese PLA or uh, the nincompoops over in Iran and North Korea and so forth. So... Uh, you know, even if it's an American, you still don't want to answer that question because you don't know who they are. <laughs> mm-hmm. And you're not supposed to be revealing that information. So it takes a, a lot of hard tracking and digging, you have to networking, and it can take years and years and years. And then you develop the uh, security clearances and, and the authorization for need to know that appropriately, out, uh, appropriately allow you access to that information. Then you find out, hey, yeah, uh, it's there. It's true. On the other hand, Sometimes the information does come out on its own, but it doesn't come out in the way that ufology likes to fantasize about it. Mm -hmm. Uh, It comes out only to specific people who have specific talents and skills, who have security clearances. They may not have the need to know, but they could have the need to know if they were presented with that requirement or if they were presented by a crash retrieval program and saying, hey, I want to bring in... uh, Gentleman XYZ, he's got the security clearance, but he doesn't have the need to know. I want to give him the need to know because I need his talent to help us solve this problem with the crash retrieval reverse engineering studies. So then they will do that. Other times, uh, that, that's the official way of doing it. That's how you officially get brought in. Uh, the other unofficial way is, again, you build a level of trust among certain individuals and uh, people within the network who... Uh, after a few years of knowing them, you work with them, they know who you are, they know what you're capable of, they know your competencies, and they want to bring the topic up on an informal basis with you, sometimes not even on an informal basis. They may want to bring the topic up outside the realm of the security apparatus, but within a skiff. In other words, there's going to be no passing of security clearances to establish that I have I'm going to be allowed to be read in on the crash retrieval program, but they'll bring me into a skiff and want to talk informally in the skiff about it and say, well, this is what we can tell you, but there's things that we can't tell you, and we can tell you those things if you can get the next level of security and authorization to get the need to know, and then we can do business with you. But before we get to that point, here's what we can tell you. 
uh, without having to cross that red line of the need to know and the proper clearances. So, so you, you work this stuff out over a number of years, you build networks and you find the right people. And then, uh, you know, you don't do it by knocking on doors. You do it just through the happenstance of having a contract with somebody or a subcontract and you're interfacing with them. And then lo and behold, you find out they're the vice president or the president of one of the legacy aerospace corporations. And uh, they happen to be a PhD of some sort of their, you know, some discipline, their own, uh, a STEM discipline all, all on their own accord. And it just so happens that they were a guy that worked on the crash retrieval program. Oh, lo and behold. And then they find out that you're working in UFOs, uh, you're on the UFO subject for a, gov- uh, for a DOD program. And they'll say, well, that's wonderful. You're officially a uh, government contractor or subcontractor, and you're working with another aerospace company. Okay, well, let's, well, and you're working on UFOs. Well, guess what? We did it too. And we don't do it now, but we did it in the past, and here's what we, here's what we can tell you off the record, and here's what we can, and, here, and you'll have to go another step before we can tell you what it is on the record, but it has to be through that. Again, you have to have the right clearances. You have to have the authorization for the need to know, and then you can get the full story. So it's a very complex process. It just, um, the way Steve Greer went about it for his disclosure program, that was called the shotgun approach. The shotgun approach means um, he was putting himself out there during the 1990s saying, talking about crash retrievals, and uh, I, I won't go through his whole story. I'm sure you've already covered it or other people have covered it. But one thing led to another, and he... Uh, he he like was like a bar magnet tracking all these retirees from from various parts of the government u s military who had some knowledge about the u f o subject and the crash retrieval subject in particular and uh, a good majority of them were crackpots they were phonies, but there was a small number of them that were the real deal hmm. and so he successfully picked up a very small number of them and got some information and uh, now, as to the veracity and quality of that information that's another story but he did get some interesting information okay so can you share with us who you so think might have been the it. real deal so that's what I, huh? could you share with us who you think might have been the real deal out of his witnesses no 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 what i mean is the information people, the information was not was was uh was verifiable in other words, once people looked into it, they said, "Yeah, this is realistic." Okay. Whereas a good chunk, a good chunk of his disclosure witnesses, uh, you know, you had middle of the road guys. They had some information, but it was too peripheral. It was just anecdotal. Mm-hmm. And then you had the guys that were real liars. He's got a chunk of liars out there that real that he I, I he I don't know how much effort he spent on vetting any of those people, and I'm not going to name names as to who they are. And it's not important because that doesn't because the fact that they have no real information mm-hmm. means it's noise. We, we're dealing with signal. We're interested in signal in science, folks, not the noise. <laughs> Chuck right. the noise. So, so uh, he did have a small signal of people that had verifiable information, and uh, unfortunately, that's like I said, it's the shotgun approach. They came forward. They gave him information. That was freely given to him, but it was after the fact. It was nothing that could be acted on. The people that gave him information were, uh, uh, they weren't directly involved with, the, with crash retrieval um, at all. They, they actually were either peripheral or they heard it from somebody reliable. So the uh, vertical information was high quality, but they were not firsthand pe- uh, people. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. People with first-hand knowledge right. or first-hand exposure to this whole subject. So he got pretty close, but that's the shotgun approach. That's where you're going to shoot the shotgun, your pellets are going to hit all over the wall, and there's going to be a small part of the wall where the hell- pellets hit the right targets, and all the rest of the pellets, pretty much only just a few pellets hit the right target, and all the rest of the pellets just randomly uh, hit a bunch of bad targets. The and the hard target. part is that the target's invisible. We don't know. Yeah. All we yeah. have is the spread of, right. of shotgun spray, but uh, we don't know where yeah. the target is. So, yeah. So here's the thing that you should know is uh, that the crash retrieval program uh, is a very small program. It is not a massive, huge government infrastructure. It's, it's, uh, it's, a, very, it's a very poorly funded program, and it hasn't actually probably hasn't had any money for a while. Um I do know that the program was terminated in 1989 for a lack of progress in reverse engineering, anything that they had, any of the hardware that they had. 
And uh, they'll resurrect it every maybe so often, so many years go by, and they'll try it again. And they just don't succeed. But compartmentalization is a killer. Scientists cannot communicate with other scientists to get help. It's like I'm doing this this first semester differential calculus homework problem. I'm, I'm doing the rocket equation, and I am stuck on the boundary condition so I can come up with the right solution that gives me the right answer to the propellant mass flow rate. And I'm having a hard time. So what do I got to do? I, I'm missing something. I just don't know what I'm supposed to do with this and uh, to be able to solve this differential equation. So I got to call my buddy who's in my class. He's a, he's a math whiz. And he's the one that gets straight A. So I'm going to call him on the phone and say, help me with this. This is what I got done. And this is what I, I'm stuck on. And he'll explain it to me. Yeah, well, if you're in the crash retrieval program or any black program for that matter, and you come up with a roadblock, a technical roadblock, you can't call your best buddy or, or any expert that you don't know and just call him cold and say, hey, this is who I am. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm working on. I'm stuck. What do you suggest I do to get past this roadblock? You can't do that. Yeah, it's funny. It's all, it, it's, Nick Pope had talked yeah, about the it, same problem when they did the Condine report. Uh, they genuinely had some intelligence people who wanted to look into the issue, but they had no access. They couldn't talk right. to anybody who had – they weren't cleared for all of these things they wanted to write about, so they just had to speculate. Yeah. So uh, – and this isn't just unique to the uh, crash retrieval program. This type of problem is unique to all the black programs that the DOD has, DHS has them, the military services uh, – Service branches has them, but uh, uh, Department of Energy has their own versions. And, uh, you know, you, 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 the purpose of a black program with a special access program security wrap is you've got to limit the information and exposure to the information to as few people as possible in order to produce the maximum security protection against uh, espionage by the enemy. And so that limits who you can work with. That, that also is clear to know. That limits the amount of experts that you can have working with you. And gosh, you know, if, you're, if your small group of experts are stumped, you're screwed because you basically can't call your buddies or somebody you know or somebody you know of who's an expert better than you or, be, or you know, a bigger expert on the subject at, an, at a university either near you or at a university across the country. You can't call those guys. You can't even read them in because you're not supposed to acknowledge uh, some of these black, most of these black programs are not supposed to be acknowledged. So, uh, you know, for that basis, it, you don't legitimately exist. So you can't tip, tip off the, uh, the university expert that there's a program by calling him and saying, I'm stuck on something. You just can't do it. If it's really dire and it's a problem that really the expertise is desperately needed outside of the cleared group, then the program manager and the security officer will um, will write a justification to uh, go reach out to the university expert and read him in on the program, and they'll have to be given security clearances and sign the NDA, you know, fill out the SF-86 and, and all those forms and get the DD-254 filled out. And uh, then they'll be told, you know, you you go you die with this information. You can never talk about it until after you die. <laughs> so until after you're dead. Um, so that's how that works. And it happens in uh, cruise missile programs. It happens mostly programs involving uh, covert clandestine operations and their logistics. It happens with nuclear weapons development and deployment. It happens with intelligence operations. And, and it happens with technology development. And the interesting thing is that today there's a big move away from special access programs. They're extremely costly to maintain, extremely costly. Let me tell you this. Uh, the cost to maintain information, personnel, and physical security for a special access program can be tens of times larger than the cost of the program itself. So let's say the program is building the B-21 bomber, right? Let's just assume, let's say for the sake of argument, the bomber project is $50 billion total. That's probably not even reasonable, <laughs> but I'll just say that for you. The security for that is going to be, could be as much as 10 times higher. I mean, it could be stretched out over a number of years, of course, not all at once. So it could be as much as 10 times higher because you've got to maintain all kinds of security. Now, wow. that's just hypothetical. That's amazing. So, so we're, we're pretty I've, much I've, out of time. I've seen, I've seen, oh, okay. 
Yeah, so I want to ask you one last question, and it has to do with the technology yeah. development like you uh, had just mentioned. But essentially, uh, you know, the goal, I think it's been your goal and, and Hal's goal and it's To The Stars goal, is to actually – um, use what you've learned from the observation of the phenomena to develop a technology. Do you think that's sure. possible, and is that possible in the near time? Uh, probably, it, it, it's hard to predict. Um, mm -hmm. It's really hard to predict. Uh, it probably is long term, not near term. More, some of these projects that were, like for example, that's what the thirty-eight papers that the TIA wanted in their task mm -hmm. with their bigger Aerospace space advanced space studies contract was to take the physics that we, physics and engineering of twenty of two thousand nine and twenty ten, extrapolated to twenty fifty. Are we going to be able to have the physics and engineering and a technology industrial base that'll produce a vehicle that'll match the Tic Tacs by twenty fifty? Because what if the Tic Tacs decide all of a sudden? to turn against us. And they use their advanced weaponry, whatever right. they have, and start hurting people, start destroying things. I mean, we haven't seen that happen, but we've seen hints of that during uh, Blue Book's investigation of the Northern Tier Stack uh, encounters with the giant UFOs that shut down their warhead navigation systems. Mm. And that happened multiple times. That happened in the late 60s and happened in the mid-70s. And, so, um, and so we know that they're quite, quite capable of rendering our nuclear warheads and ICBMs useless, which is really dangerous because if the Soviet Union had decided to launch a war right then and there, just coincidentally, the damn UFOs had, had rendered it impossible for us to do a counter-strike because our goddamn ICBMs up in the northern tier were shut down. So, so that's an example of when it gets bad. And then there's Colaris. Colaris is an example where the box-shaped UFOs that they call chupas were actually killing some people and injuring large numbers of people. Wow. And, uh, and they were using beams to do it. And I'm sure you're familiar with the Colaris case from the 1970s, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Somewhat. And um, what, that was Project Plate. That's what, the, what, that's what the Brazilians call Project Plate, I believe. So the Brazilian Air Force. So, um, so that's, you know, the UFOs have not been mo uh, benevolent. They have not shown any brotherly, you know, space brotherly love and peace type movements toward us. It's all been just hide and seek, hide and seek. We use stealth as much as possible so that humans don't see us in the environment. And then when we want to expose ourselves, we expose ourselves, do our little fun games, and then take off. And they may be testing our technology. They may be testing the U.S. Navy's capabilities when they do this. Mm -hmm. and, um, and also they've done it with the Air Force, too. So, you know, what are they doing it for? Well, again, they're not humans, so they don't think like humans. Right. Um, they're doing it for whatever. Um, in, in case they decide to become aggressive, we're screwed, <laughs> basically. <laughs> we don't have aircraft that can match them. We, you know, we haven't shot at them. Those, uh, you know, the Nimitz was out on a, um, on a uh, certification training to get certified to go uh, deploy at the Persian Gulf in November 2004. And so for the certification training, they just have their fighters taking off the carrier deck of, of Nimitz and flying around doing maneuvers, but they're not armed because they're not supposed to be. You know, you don't want them shooting at your, at your fellow planes. It's not a red... I think, I think it, they might have had red team, blue team things going on. Yeah, or they, they might have just been doing routine. Yeah, so, but you can't have, like, ammunition. For right. Um, uh, when they want to do bombing and strafing, they do that out at uh, the Nevada uh, Air Force weapons testing range near uh, the test site. And that's mm -hmm. where they can do all the strafing and bombing they want with live ordnance. But when you're over the ocean and you're near ships and you've got your buddies in the air and a, and a red team, blue team type configuration, you don't want to, you can't have live ordnance. Right. They had no way of shooting them down. They were asked if they were armed so they could attempt to shoot one down or just at least send off a missile or fire some guns to kind of scare the UFO into responding. And they, you know, the pilot said, no, we're not armed. We don't have anything. Mm -hmm. They couldn't shoot them down. So that was a test that could not be performed to determine whether you could shoot one down. So, um, so we just don't know. But you've got to worry about it. That's what intelligence yeah. and military doctrine are all about. It's about planning for potentialities. And we have to worry about something more advanced could be overwhelming our military technology. And so we've got to be able to extrapolate to 2050. Will our physics be there? Will our engineering be there? Will our industrial manufacturing technology be there to produce Tic Tac type technologies? And on the flip side of that, boy, that would be wonderful if we could get there. 
because commercially it would revolutionize transportation and energy on the earth, mm-hmm. you know, for all countries. So, so TTSA is looking to benefit, you know, that's a public benefit corporation. So right. we're looking to benefit the public with this. We're not looking at making weapons. The military needs to look at making the weapons. And that's why we have the 38 papers. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So that was a lot of help. That was a lot of information. Thank you so much. It's great that you talk fast because there's a lot of information to convey. But it was an absolute pleasure to have you on, and I hope we can have you on again one day. Watch more podcast clips now on our YouTube channel. Go to Livewire Podcast Clips and watch more great podcast videos just like this one.